Weather here is wonderful. You have to give me an introduction. Today, I am very happy to introduce John Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the uh, effusive introduction, and um, that's great you could tell the audience so much about my background. So um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, mice, and um, these are the inbred mice that um, geneticists, mouse geneticists, have used for well, at least 100 years. And um, what I'm going to be telling you is about our attempts to um, try and change the, um, the way that uh, mouse geneticists think and uh, introduce them to some interesting new problems. Uh, so just to quote Zar on this, uh, human genetics, there's about two problems and a thousand people chasing it, whereas in mouse genetics, there are a thousand problems and only two people working on it. So this is great for you guys, but uh, to try and interest you in some of these problems, I'm going to go and give you a bit of background and explain what the issues are. And I'm assuming most of you haven't done any of this, and this will all therefore be relatively new to you. And the other thing I need to say is almost all the work that I'm talking about is done with my friend Richard, who despite that photograph, he's a mathematician. <laughs> And uh, we work very closely together, but Richard basically deals with all the mathematics and I deal with all of the biology. Therefore, although personally I think that some of the best work we've done has really been in the way that we analyse the data, I'm not the best person to explain this to you. I will do my best, but if there are specific questions about the algorithms, then it's best that you email Richard, who'll be more than happy to answer your questions. So what I'm going to do is just give you a very quick... Uh, overview of what we think is a, a, a major problem in, in mouse genetics, which is about mapping resolution. How do you get down, how do you use mouse genetics to, to uh, identify um, at high resolution loci contributing to complex phenotypes? And I'm going to go through, first of all, how this, was, this has been thought of by the mouse community, and I'll show you how we've tried to adapt those approaches. So as I've said, Mouse geneticists always use inbred strains, and the standard design for mapping a complex trait is one like this, where you have two inbred strains, and you cross, and the first generation is the F1, and then you can do one of two things. You can cross this F1 back to the parental strains, or you can interbreed to produce an F2. And then, to map, all you're going to need is some markers to distinguish on this set of chromosomes, whether they're homozygote or heterozygote, and this used to be done, and I'll show you this is a very old slide, by using PCR to amplify short polymorphic regions in the genome. And because there's, there are only two uh, haplotypes segregating, two inbred strains, there are obviously only going to be two alleles. So then all you need to do is read along here and decide whether you've got two bands, or one band coming from one parent, or one band uh, which is a homozygote, both alleles coming from the, the other parental strain. So the genotyping reduces to the simple problem of identifying those genotypes. And then you can, at each locus, very simply run an analysis of variance. So here I'm showing a phenotype on this scale. And these are the three genotypic classes that you've got out of the genotypes. And you just uh, then test whether there's a significant difference at that locus. And you can see in this case there clearly would be. You don't really need to run a statistical test. And you can see also very clearly that it must be additive, that the heterozygote lies nicely in, in the middle between the two homozygote genotypes. And then you can work out a p-value of that association for each of the loci that you genotype. And because, if you go back to my figure here, you can see that there aren't that many recombinations. We're only dealing with one generation. So you, at the most, you'll get two or three recombinants per chromosome. You don't need very many markers, so four or five, not the millions and millions that people use in, in human genetics. So a small number of markers, and you'll get enough information to produce a, a figure that looks like this, where we have the likelihood on this axis. This is just looking across the mouse genome, and this is a, a 10 to the minus um, scale, so it's 10 to the minus 14. And there's something clearly on chromosome 1, 7, and 15. So a relatively simple analysis to, to run and some fairly clear-cut results. So that's the sort of workhorse design that people have used now for about 20 years or so. And the fundamental problem it has is as follows. So this is looking in at a single chromosome. And I'm showing again 
um, a, a phenotype on the, on the horizontal, uh, the association as log units on the horizontal scale, on the vertical scale, and you can quite cl clearly see there's, there's an effect somewhere over here, but you want to find whatever is contributing to that, and it's a very large region, so in this case, almost half the chromosome. So the problem with those inbred strain crosses is a problem of mapping resolution. So we have been thinking, how could we reduce this interval to get down to ideally the causative variant, or if we can't even do that, then, then maybe the gene. And the nice thing about working in model organisms is that you can do experiments, unlike in humans, where you're basically stuck with the material that you have in model organism genetics. You can think and work out what might be a way to address this problem. And then what we have thought about is a design that's based on this observation. So this top part of the figure is what I've shown you before. This is the uh, setting up an, a, a cross to produce an F1 and an F2. But if you continued to interbreed an F3 and an F4 and keep going, then clearly each generation will accumulate more recombinations. And that should, because you've got a smaller interval between two markers, increase resolution. So that's a pretty simple idea. There's a, a, a slight twist on this, which is that in fact, what we were, we were using were animals that, that look, like, look like this. These are heterogeneous stock mice. So they're slightly different from the, from the design I showed you in that rather than having two strains to start with, they derive from eight inbred strains. And we'd like them to, in this case, the animals that we use have been randomly mating for about 50 generations rather than the three and four, so we should increase resolution. And the chromosomes we look like are represented here as a mosaic of each of the founder strains. And the distance between each chromosomal breakpoint should give us the mapping resolution. So that, simplistically put, is the design that we thought up. And we collected some animals and genotypes and phenotypes, and I won't go into that. But I will tell you about two specific issues then, that then arose. So the first, HS in this case is the heterogeneous stock. That's the animals I introduced. And there are two analysis problems I want to go through with you. The first one I'll call a phasing problem. So I'll make this very easy, and we'll have just uh, haploid. We're not going to have diploid animals. And I'm going to have just four strains to make it simplistic. And I'm going to have one locus that's contributing to the phenotype, the QTL. And over here, I'm going to have the marker. So this is what I, information I don't have. And this is the information that I, I can acquire from genotyping. So we can assign an effect to that QTL. We can say that the T increases the phenotype by 10 and the A allele decreases it by 10. And if we were lucky enough to actually genotype that marker, then we'd get results that look like this. So if you can simply add up the two Ts here, then we'll get 10. T plus A will give you 0. And the two As will give you minus 20. Very simple. But of course, we don't have that information. We have this marker here. So if you apply the same logic that that locus, this is what you get. You can see that that C is associated with a 10 here, but this C is associated with a minus 10. So we actually get no association. There's no difference between those three, three genotypic classes at that locus, even though it's only four base pairs away from the thing we're trying to find. So this we regard as a phasing problem. And the way that we can solve this is by working rather than with the marker, but with the haplotype. So in other words, if we had this information, strain A, so we have that C as part of the whole strain A haplotype, then we know that is associated with a T there. And this one we know is associated with a minus T. So we can then run a haplotypic association rather than the single marker association. So then the question resolves into how do we work out mouse haplotypes? And the way we do that is to consider the problem as being one of having an observed chromosome structure. We only have two alleles. Concealing a hidden chromosome structure when, in fact, any particular position of the genome descends from one of the eight progenitor strains. And the way that we solve this problem is by using a dynamic programming algorithm 
So I'm just showing a little output of what we might expect to get. So we might have two markers here. This is information for one chromosome. And what we're going to try and do is work out the probability of its descent from one of the founder strains. And our results will come out in a form like that, where rather than using a, uh, a simple genotype, we now have the probability of haplotypic descent. So this will be the information we use, and then we can map with that. And as I explained earlier, I'm not going to go through the mathematics, but we can ask my friend Richard if you really want to know. And then just to show you how important this is, here is uh, a piece of chromosome which we've analysed by single marker association. So this is ig ignoring haplotypes. And if you look, this is a threshold. It looks like there's an effect here, but it's only just above significance. So our question is, what happens when we analyse this region using our haplotypic approach? And this is fortuitously called happy, and as you can see, we do indeed get a nice happy result, which is that we find a large effect here, larger than we'd, we'd see with the uh, single marker analysis. Note the threshold, because it's haplotypic, has more degrees of freedom, is a bit higher than the single marker, but we still exceed it. And note also that whereas you might think from single marker, the most likely position was here, the haplotypic association tells you that you were wrong, it's actually over here. So it's slightly more powerful, and it gives you a better indication of where the locus is. The second problem is that of population structure. And I'm, because people talk about this a lot, I'm, I'm not going to go into exactly how we solve this problem, but I do want to just show you how important a problem it is. So let's just ignore it and analyse our data. So I'm now going to analyse a whole phenotype, ignoring population structure. So population structure means different degrees of relatedness between the animals. Some of them are second cousins, some of the third cousins twice removed, some are unrelated. There's a different degrees of population structure, and we're going to ignore that and run us our haplotypic association. And we get a wonderful result. Look at that. So many loci. There's my threshold. I'm getting stuff here, log p's of 30, and I must have about a, almost 200 loci all contributing to that phenotype. So I'm very happy at that. And then if I add up the individual contributions from each of those loci, I'm able to explain about 400% of the phenotypic variation. So there's no missing heritability for us. So we need to deal with this issue, and the way we do that currently is with mixed models. And if we do that, then things turn into something a little bit more reasonable, and we find that rather than having 200 loci, we have about two or three. So those are the two problems that we face in, in the analysis. But now let me go back to really why we did this, which is to try and increase mapping resolution. So let's look in detail. So here's a good example on one chromosome where we've done pretty well. We found a number of, of positions on that chromosome that contribute to our phenotype. And these peaks look reasonably sharp. But when you zoom in, we're still looking often at about two to three megabases of DNA, and in this case, even more. There's about 10 megabases. So it's doing much better than our initial mapping with inbred strain crosses, but it's not getting us down to the gene. So that is as far as we got by about 2003, 2004, so about 10 or so years ago. And I um, visited this place. So these are racks of mice, each of those cages contains some mice. And, and this is like in a warehouse. It goes on and on and on and on. This is a commercial mouse breeder. I thought, being a mouse user, that commercial mouse breeders sold the inbred strains to universities. But that's not what they do. They sell these animals to pharmaceutical companies for drug testing. And they produce tens, hundreds of thousands of mice. This facility was producing something like a quarter of a million mice per week. A lot of mice. And uh, I sort of plucked up courage to ask this question, like, what happens if you don't have enough takers for these animals? Because that's a lot of mice you're producing. Oh, they said, we sell them for snake food. So I said, well, that's interesting. So it you, you, sounds like you're chucking this a lot away. Would you mind if we looked at the genetic structure of these populations? Because as as far as I could tell, no one had characterized them. They had this outbred stock 
we have an effective population size sometimes in the thousands and they've got high turnover, they're generating many generations, so they should have some interesting genetic properties. So we asked them to send us some DNA. And just to give you a, a little view as to what this looks like, I'm going to show this uh, in the following format, which is something that human geneticists do. This is looking at the linkage disequilibrium, uh, the degree of correlation between markers. And this is from uh, where I started, the F2 population. So we don't need very many markers to capture information across the chromosome, six markers. And this triangle here shows the pairwise correlation between each of the markers. And the redder the square is, the higher the correlation. So if it's deep red, the correlation here is greater than 0.9. So that tells you you're really not getting very much information separately between those two. And the pinker it is, the paler it is, the less correlation there is. So that shows that basically you're, you're collecting almost all the information that you want to. Everything's correlated if you have that number of markers across the chromosome. And that is another way of showing you why the resolution is so poor. Using the same format, here's the result from the heterogeneous stock. So now you can see that the, the red triangles, which show the degree of correlation, are, are sharper. Um, note that there's some red right the way down here, and that's a product of the, coral, of the population structure. This is when we happen to be testing, say, two siblings. And for some of the animals, of course, there will be a lot of correlation. And we can deal with that in the way I've described. But what we're interested here is the sharpness of those triangles. So they're better, but not great. Here are the results of the same way from some populations we got from what I showed you before. And now we're doing pretty well. There's, we have to put down many more markers to see this, of course. But you can see in some cases, these little uh, triangles are really very tight indeed. And as a simple way of thinking about this, the length here between these triangles gives you an indication of your potential mapping resolution. So this doesn't look too bad. Now, just to show you that compared to humans, this is uh, for a, a, a similar plot for the human genome. And you can see that it's, it's, it's a lot better. Uh, but in places, we thought somewhere like here, for instance, we'd have a pretty good chance of mapping down to, to, a, to a, the level of a gene. So the first thing we needed to do was characterize the genetic structure of these populations. And uh, the postdoc who was doing this uh, wrote to uh, each of the um, places marked on this map. And she'd write and say, since you're throwing away the mice, could you send us some DNA or some tails? And we'll extract the DNA and look. And people from here were very kind and sent us uh, tails, uh, and from Australia. And from most of Europe, except for France, where they charged us 10 euros per tail. God knows why. It's very, very marked characteristic, that was. So we take about 100 of these populations, and now we're going to ask, what is the mapping resolution? And the first problem we came across was, actually, you know, there isn't, I couldn't find at least, a good industry worked out measure for mapping resolution. So how, how do you know that you're going to get good mapping resolution? What would you, what would you use? Um, we decided to use a, um, uh, a measure of the linkage disequilibrium, the genetic correlation, decay. So we'd say, well, within what distance do we get a decay of half? So we call that our LD um, decay radius. And I plotted this as the black squares on, on, this, um, on, this, on this figure. And it's a scale in megabases. That's on this scale here. And the other interesting thing, the other thing we were interested in was the, a, a measure of the degree of genetic variation. And for that, we took the mean minor allele frequency. So if you took an, uh, an F1, for example, everything's 50%, so it will be a 0.5. And if there's very little heterozygosity, then you'll be right down here. So if we start off with, um, oh, actually, let's start off with some simple things. So, so if we're dealing with outbred populations, then the mean minor allele frequency should, should be above zero. And if you look on here and here, there are quite a few of these which were totally inbred. So what the breeders were saying were outbred mice and have been selling in hundreds of thousands to pharmaceutical companies were actually inbred mice. And the pharmaceutical companies didn't know this. And we were a little bit embarrassed about even telling the companies that sent us this DNA because they'd done it like for free and things. So this is not good, having little red dots down here. So you want something a bit higher. The HS, I've indicated here, is about up here. 
the mean mapping of the LD decay radius we want to be as low as possible. So these are wild mice at the end here. So that's what you might see in, in the equivalent in, a, in, in outbred human populations. Maybe a little bit worse in, in the mice because these come from, from Arizona. Uh, it's not clear that, they, that they're representative of mice elsewhere in the world, but they're clearly much better than anything else, else around here. So we can sort of di divide this into three. There's the, the stuff over here which is clearly useless. I mean, this, anything over here is not really going to work. The stuff over here which we'd really like to work with, and there's a sort of block in the middle. So my intention, therefore, was to choose some of these animals, and then we could use them for mapping. That seems a reasonable assumption. But you have to deal, in mouse genetics, with a person called the veterinarian. So these are people that uh, run the facilities where mice are kept, and they do not let what they call dirty mice into their facilities. And a dirty mice is one that's defined by finding an infection in one test out of 100, or sometimes even in even larger number. And if you, they find that, then they'll require you to, uh, to re-derive the, the mice. In other words, what you have to do is take that mouse, take embryos um, in a sterile condition, and then bring those mice back into your facility and then breed the mice. We were talking about doing this with two to 3,000 animals and at a cost of a few hundred dollars per re-derivation. You can see this was not going to be possible. Now, the ways in which uh, people define a clean mouse varied a lot, but essentially, unfortunately for us, none of these animals were clean. So we were forced to take something which wasn't ideal. So we've been working with a stock up here. I just want to finish this first part of the presentation with a summary. This is from a figure uh, of a paper that I wrote with Eliezer. And uh, the idea of this was just to show you for these three strategies, the F2 cross. This is, uh, um, doesn't say heterogeneous stock because this is Eliezer's uh, sort of equivalent. People wouldn't mind me putting it that way sort of the intermediate, and then these are the outbred stocks. So this is the locus we're mapping at the end of chromosome one, and you can see the, the blue sort of maps it okay, but it's a broad peak. Um, the, the red does pretty well, but it looks like the green, which is the outbred stock, does best. So that sort of convinced us this, this would be worth, worth trying. So that's our design issue and the problems we faced. And for the second part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about the experiment itself. So let me introduce you to Jerome. Jerome led this project, and it's really up, it was uh, entirely his work, so I'm speaking on his behalf. And Jerome and I went to the mouse breeder, this is in Charles River, and the first thing we needed to make sure was that they gave us the mice we wanted. Lots of problems can occur here. So the first problem is that, as you can, I think, maybe see here, here's a, you can see little baby mice here, little pink things. So we only want one of those pink things. We don't want two or three, because these are siblings. So you have to tell them that you're only going to want one from each cage. And they fuss about this, because that'll mean that the other ones may, may, may be thrown away, because uh, they can't use them. It disturbs the animals and so on. So, but we were clear about that. And the other thing, of course, is we don't want first cousins or any other relatives. So we want them as remotely related as, as they possibly can. And then clearly we do want them all from the same stock. We want them all from this, uh, the CFW is the one we use, but some issues around making sure they're clear. The second problem we faced was where the colony was. This is in Kalamazoo. And when I did this experiment, I was in Oxford in the United Kingdom. That means the mice have to travel quite a long way and they have to do it by train, and then by plane, and then there's a bus that picks them up and, and, and avoiding all of those uh, animal rights protesters uh, have to get through and deliver them to the mouse testing facility. So this is not great if you work, as we do, on behavior, because you're going to give them a little bit of a stressful life experience, you know, sitting about on the tarmac for six hours before the plane takes, you know, the sorts of things that are going to happen. It's bad for mice as well. And... We set up the following protocol. So we allowed about eight weeks from getting the mice until they were actually transferred to us. So there's a, uh, and, then, and then this worked in our favor. The, um, the, the vets insisted on a two-month quarantine, despite the fact they tested the hell out of them for various uh, uh, diseases. They, we had to keep them there before they'd... Which is great, it's settling in time. 
and then we would be testing them um, for uh, this period of time here. So this is in, in weeks. And there's a little summary at the bottom here about some of the things that we were collecting. So these are acronyms EPM, OFT, PAS for tests of behavior. There's an elevated plus maze as a test of anxiety. There's tests of startle and fear conditioning. There's a swim test. I'll talk to you a bit more. There's a colleague who were interested in response to hypoxia and also some colleagues interested in cardiovascular phenotypes, ECHO and ECG. And at the end, Jerome set up a vocalization test. So um, he recorded male mice when they were exposed to female and um, has lots of recordings which we're still trying to interpret. And at the end of the experiment, we take lots of tissues and we can derive lots of different phenotypes from those. So a very uh, comprehensive assessment. I want to just show you a couple of those. So uh, this, is an, this is an open field, a scary in environment for the mouse. You stick the mouse in here and see er, how much he moves. This is a, an apparatus, these two in fact, where we um, train the animal to, be as to associate a certain uh, environment, in this case a, a, a tone with a foot shock, and then measure how well they learn that and how, what their response to that is like. And this is a bit more difficult to see, but over here there are three buckets of water three glass uh, jars, and the, uh, this is a, it's hard to believe, but this is an industry standard test for depression. You drop the mouse into one of those, and you time how long it takes for him to stop swimming. So the animal that gives up quickly is a depressed mouse, and the one that keeps on struggling is not depressed. And anyway, so that's, that's the industry standard. Yeah. Also, should point out, the uh, Home Office, which regulates uh, the use of animals in my country, um, doesn't like this sort of thing. It's stressful for the animal, so getting permission to do it is very hard. So it's a not very good test, which is pretty hard to get past anyway. Do they die? If you leave them, yeah, they'll drown. Yeah. So we have to have in lots of protocols about if the animal appears to be motionless after five minutes, whip it out quickly and resuscitate it and so on. Yeah. And the other thing we worked with was these sort of colleagues in Amsterdam who managed to get uh, ECG traces on the mice like that. And they also had an echocardiogram. I'm not showing you that. We didn't get actually much useful data. So they, they, they were looking at um, uh, heart volumes and, uh, um, or by imaging. And this apparatus at the bottom here is for sleep. So we did a, a three-day sleep cycle and get a, a, a measure of how much the animal moves, and from that you can work out their sleep cycle. And we did all of this in this facility, the uh, mouse phenotyping facility at Harwell. So this, is, this has been around for, for many years. It's, um, what it's been doing for the last 10 or 15 years is looking at phenotypes in, in ENU mutagenized mutant mice either produced by um, mutagenizing the animals or more recently by engineering the genome, knocking out the genes. And because of that, they are very, very clean. And we had a lot of negotiation to get this project sorted out. In fact, the only way we did this is by having a sort of dirty area set up, but I'm very pleased with them, to them for, for helping us. So 2,017 animals tested over two years. And then we had the problem of genotyping them. So if you remember, I said there were two problems. There was a phasing problem, which we sort out by our haplotypic approach. And the second problem is uh, population structure, which we can sort out using mixed models. Now, when I explained to you how we do the haplotypic method, I said what we do is we derive each of the genotypes as a probability of descent from one of the founders. And in our HS, we know the founders. There are eight. But what about this stock? We don't know. If we genotype them, do we know whether the variants that we detect <coughs> exist in known inbred strains? And the answer to that was, unfortunately, about a quarter of the variants were not present in inbred strains. That meant that we couldn't use our haplotypic method. We are now falling into the realm of the problems that face human geneticists. But we didn't just give up and use single marker analysis. We thought about this and came up with the following suggestion. So normally, if you have a, a missing data problem, you'd use 
imputation. So if we have a set of genotypes we don't know where they come from or what they are, we can work out the genotypes that exist, the imputed genotypes, by reference to a reference panel. So this is the haplotypes that, that we know, this is the data that we have, and that's what we generate. And as I've just said to you, this is the information we don't have. So we're going to try and go from this to this without using that. So that's stating the problem, and how do we, how do we solve it? So the data we use was genotyping by sequencing. So it's not on an array. We can't use an array because we don't know what variants are in the population. So clearly that's not going to work. So we do it by, by DNA sequencing. So I've given four haplotypes down here. And uh, let's say we've got these sequencing reads at the top here. So, but actually the data we've got is a bit more sophisticated than that. So I'll represent it in the following way. The arrows represent the direction of the reads. So remember in, in DNA sequencing, next generation sequencing, you get a little bit of sequence, about 400 base pairs, and then uh, a little bit of DNA, and you sequence both ends of it. And you know the, the orientation. So you know that this read and this read both come from the same piece of DNA. And similarly, uh, that one and that one. So we have the orientation information. And that means occasionally, as in here, you might have a variant in one and a variant in the other. If you refer down to the haplotypes at the bottom, you can see this T here must come from either of those two strains, and this C must come from that haplotype B. So that information would tell you immediately that this must come from the green haplotype. And the other bit of information we might get is occasionally we might have more than one variant which will unambiguously define the origin of... Uh, but actually, this doesn't unambiguously, it'll give a 50-50 chance of being one of the others. So we've got sequence variants within, and we've got the information we can get by looking at the matched uh, read pair. So we thought we could use that information to try and work out where things came from. And in this case, we're using very low coverage. We worked this out, I won't show you why, but we thought this would be sufficient. And this is how we solve the problem. So we start, and I'll do this just with four haplotypes, we start by by randomly assigning the probability of descent from one of our founders for each locker. So what you're seeing here are uh, markers across a region of the genome which have been randomly assigned as to one of the other descending uh, haplotypes that were uh, uh, progenitors. In this case, we're just assuming two progenitors. So just at starting phase. And then what we do is we take our real data. So let me talk you through this. So these bars here represent the sequence that we've got. In many cases, we just have a single read. In some cases, we have two reads. In some cases, we might even have three or more, but that's very, very unusual. So mostly, we're just dealing with a single read. And we have our randomized set of uh, information up here. And what we do is we take the, the information that we've got, and the, we then work out the probability, using the sequence information, and as I've, as I've explained, that it might have come from one or the other. And we can do this. Um, as a series of um, iterations. So I've put down here, we've done this with 40 expectation maximization iterations, each which, which involves determining the states, so going down on this side, and then reworking out, given what we found here, so update the parameters on the right-hand side. And then the parameter updates using the sample reads and the haplotype probabilities that we get from here. So it's an iterative process. We're taking this information and continuing to update. And, and the longer we can run, keep this running, the better we think our estimates will be. So this stage of our method is simply to try and work out what the progenitors might be at any particular locus. And then when we've done that, it's relatively straightforward to use the same approach of working out imputation, because now We've got what we think are the progenitor haplotypes, and now, as before, we can impute and get, uh, get our, our genotypes from that. So it's a two-stage process where we're using the information in two different ways. One, to work out the progenitors, and then secondly, to do the imputation. And this method, which we've termed sequencing to imputation through constructing the haplotypes, uh, we've checked against, our, uh, against a series of, of uh, genotypes that we got from an array, and here are the results. So this is using a standard mouse array called the, the Mega Mooga. This is the correlation between what we get from our imputation method and from the array. And 
on the horizontal axis, I've divided up the results by the minor allele frequency. So these are the, this is uh, common, 0.5, down to rare, less than 0.10. We're using our method, and we're comparing it to a number of others. Beagle is a standard method that uh, human genomes need, but Beagle performs with a reference genome with a reference set of haplotypes, and we're, we're not giving it a reference set of haplotypes because we, obviously we, we don't know that. So our method does, as you can see, very well, but of course it's a method we design, so other people's hands it might perform differently. And the other thing we were interested in was the effect of sequence coverage. So this was done on 0.15. If we did it at 0.3 or 0.5 or 1 or even a higher coverage, what would we get? And we were surprised to find, so point. We're down at uh, this one here. We're actually surprised to find that lower coverages actually would do, would uh, uh, do, do quite well. Um, even down to 0 0.03, we're actually getting quite a lot of information. So that's something that might be worth following up. It means that really you could get, um, in this case, about 0.80% of the information with common variants uh, in a large population. This is the number of animals that you might need. So the more animals you put in, then the better the estimates are. And this led us to ask the following question. Would this method work on more outbred populations? So could we use this in, in um, obviously in humans? But there are many other populations which are pretty outbred where we don't have phased haplotypes. So anyone working in agricultural genetics, working in pigs, dogs, plants, many species where there is almost nothing known about genetics, would this work? So we tested this on a, on, a, on a set of data that we had to hand, which is sequence data on 12,000 Chinese women. And our coverage here is low. It's 1.5x. So it's 10 times what we have for the mouse, but still very low for, for, um, for human studies. So we ran, and I'll show you the results, just in the same way I should do for the mouse data, comparison with genotyping data. So this is, uh, again, stitched. Now, Beagle will do much better here because it's, we're using reference panel. But um, you can see this bit of difference. We think our method does better, but be all pretty comparable to what we're getting. So the answer to that question was straightforward. Yes, this would work. So we think this is an important method, and it could be applied to any outbred population where you don't have the information. In fact, all you're going to need is the, uh, a, a good reference genome. You don't have to know any of the variants beforehand. If you do with the sequence, you get the variants and you'll get the genotypes from our method. And then just to show you the, the similar uh, result from sequence coverage, our starting point was 1.7x, and we downsampled to see what, how, how well we'd, we'd uh, recover stuff. And the, the lowest is at 0.3, so for common variants, uh, and this is for large sample size, it's about 0.7 in terms of the correlation with genotype arrays. So do you have data? Do you have the reference? Or what is the component that you lack in this method? And so what is the likelihood? So what, 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 what human ge genomes need to do this is you need a phased set of reference haplotypes. Okay. And that's great if you're working with human populations. Not great if you're working uh, with cattle or with pigs or with mice where you don't know the, the backgrounds. So, so, so now you don't need that information. All you would need is uh, a reference genome, because so you're going to have to map back to the reference genome. You need a reference genome, and then you just sequence. And we think you don't need to sequence at great depth. So even on the outbred populations, uh, if you did about a 1.4x coverage, you'll recapture most of, most of the information, even in relatively small sample sizes. If you were working on a very large population, you could go with less coverage. So the likelihood is with respect to the reference genome, the likelihood in your EM? So this is, um, with this, the com this is a comparison between the genotypes from an array. That makes sense? Yeah. No, wait. Oh. You described that EM yes. algorithm. Yes. 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 So your, your likelihood that you maximize is with Um, it's, well, in this, so, I think I may have misled you. So you're talking about this figure here. Exactly. Yes. So, so we're, we're maximizing the return on, the, on our reconstruction of the ancestral probabilities. Oh. So we don't know this information. We're just guessing it each time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
OK, so I'll move on to describe what we found. So the first thing I want to just briefly talk about is a, a bit about the population itself. So this is an uncharacterized uh, population of mice. Um, and we'd like to know a little bit about the variants and how they're distributed. And this figure shows you the heterozygosity as a measure per kilobase across the genome. On this axis, I've laid out the chromosomes. And what you can see is there's a huge variation here. And I want particularly to point out chromosome 16 here. And if you notice, it's almost homozygous. So an, almost an entire chromosome here has gone to fixation. Other chromosomes, I think chromosome 4, I think, was a, as, a, as a good example, um, has a, a large region where there's a, a lot of heterozygosity, as on, as on chromosome 2. So this is a very patchy distribution. And this is not an area I'm deeply expert in, but it seems to me that working with these populations, there should be some interesting questions for population genetics as to what forces are contributing to, degree, to give that degree of, uh, of, of variation. And just to look at that in, in another way, this is the, the total number of variants. So I mentioned chromosome 16. So you can see here we only had 51,000 variants um, as against most chromosomes of equal size, where there are almost 10 times or uh, five times as, 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 as many. So the total of variants we found is about 5 million, uh, but the number that we, we were using for the, um, for the genetic mapping was only a fraction of those because, of course, a lot of these are in link linkage disequilibrium. But this strategy, even at this relatively low coverage, 0.15, captures, we think, almost all the common variants. So we get a large amount of variation here, and we can use that in various ways. The second thing is to look at uh, the, the, the uh, in terms of minor allele frequency. So what I'm showing you here is the minor allele frequency of four groups. So the HS I talked to you about before, this is what we used before, the heterogeneous stock. That's this gray line here. And what you can see is pretty flat across the minor allele frequencies. So whether you've got a, a common allele or a rare allele, the minor allele frequencies of those are pretty uh, uh, the, 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 sorry, the frequencies of those given here are pretty consistent. We're not getting an excess of rare variants. There's no real change as you go across. If you go at the top here, put wild Indian. This is, these are wild mice, and this is just, as it were, as a comparison with other fully outbred populations. And here, there's a pretty characteristic curve which goes up. This is the same you'll see in human populations with the, uh, the bulk of variants are rare. So there's large numbers of variants which are very rare in the population. So the, the uh, CFW, that we put known and novel uh, as two separate blocks. The two lines follow each other. The red and the blue line here show a sort of intermediate position. So they're not showing the same very rare variant uh, as we see in, in humans, but nor do they show this r relatively flat distribution shown in the HS. So they're sort of intermediate between these two, these two populations. This is just to show you uh, uh, that there is not very much population structure. This is, these are principal components plots, PC1, PC2, PC3, PC4, and so on, in our, in our, in our outbred population. So our guess uh, that this was a fairly outbred un set of unrelated animals looks to be true. And remember, I did tell the breeders to make sure that they didn't give us siblings, and they seem to have obeyed that, um, that command. And finally, let's turn to the, to the genetic mapping. So um, uh, we have about 200 phenotypes. Uh, we used about 360,000 SNPs, a small fraction of the 5.7 million. That's to capture almost all the information in the genome. We use a mixed model to control for population structure, and we assess the, the significance by permutations. And now for my next slide, I will show you what we call grandly a porcupine plot. All of the phenotypes mapped out on one graph, all 200 phenotypes. And huge variation in, in what we're getting. So some, some, we've truncated some of these figures, so there's something here and something here which are above the scale on the left-hand side. This one here is a variant uh, on chromosome 4 at the ALP, alkaline phosphatized locus, and this was because we were measuring Guess what? Alkaline phosphatase in the blood. So, not surprisingly, and uh, we 
hit a variant in that particular gene. So that's essentially behaving as a Mendelian. And down here, this is chromosome 17. Those of you not familiar with mouse chromosomes, this is where the major histocompatibility locus lies. And we've measured a large number of immune-related phenotypes. So not surprisingly, we're getting a lot of hits here. And indeed, one of them was, was highly significant. Second feature to notice, we've divided up the phenotypes by whether they're tissue-derived, be physiological, behavioural. The physiological will be things like the um, ECGs that I've shown you, and the behavioural are the things like the depression phenotype. And just casting your eye across this, it's not that surprising that the green dots in general are lower than the red dots. So the, the, the effect sizes we're picking up, the contribution to the phenotype, to the behavior, is in general lower than the physiological and for the, for the tissue. We then asked to what extent would what we found explain the heritability. So we work out the heritability um, from the SNPs, and then we compare that to summing up the effects that we find at each locus. And if we've explained everything, then, then our results should fall upon this line here. Each dot represents the result from a single phenotype. And again, I've broken these up into these th three categories, tissue, physiological, and behavior. So in some cases, like this one here, we're explaining about 70% or so. But for many down here, we're not doing, too, we're not, we're not doing so well. So in some cases, maybe, maybe only 5 or 10%. In general, we're explaining about 15% of the variation. Note again that for, for behavior, we do worst. So there's a lot of stuff down here which is really well off the vertical, and a lot of it is in terms of behavior. So we didn't do too well in detecting stuff for behavior. But I started this talk by saying all of this was around trying to increase resolution. So how well did we do? This is our, the, the really key test for us. This is a, 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 a genome plot, as you can see, and we've got a, a couple of peaks. We just like to look under those and just see how well we're doing. I'm showing you this one here. This is on, on chromosome 17, a nice big peak, so we've no argument that the thing's there. But um, this is a very gene-rich reason. And we've, we've got a locus here, but it's, you know, there's, it's not down to one gene. It's two or three genes, maybe. It's certainly not down to one gene. But this raised for us this issue about um, how do we define the confidence intervals. And like I said before, actually, this area hasn't been very well worked over. How do we really define the most likely position for a locus? There isn't a simple metric for that. In some cases, and this is what, what happens in, uh, mostly in human genetics, you find a single locus and it just lies quite clearly within one gene. And no one's too bothered about defining whether it goes from out here to out here. But there are many cases in our situation where that's not the case. We're not, we've not got it down as high resolution in humans uh, as in humans. So we want some way to measure the confidence intervals. So the way we addressed this problem was to take a thousand Low, uh, 1,000 SNPs at one locus. We randomly pick 1,000 of these, and we set it at anything within about 5 megabases, so 2.5 megabases either side of the peak SNP. And we just choose, choose 1,000 of those. And then we set the one we've chosen to be the causative locus, and we attribute it the same effect size as we've found here. And then we rerun the analysis, ignoring that particular SNP, and see how close the effect that we detect is to the one that we've simulated. And we just do that again and again and again and again, a thousand times, and from that get a distribution of the difference between the known locus and what we detect. And that, we've decided, is a robust but rather time-consuming way of working out the confidence interval. And this is a summary of all of those analyses across all of the loci that we found. So this is the 95% confidence interval defined in the way I've told you, in megabase units and the frequency that we've got. So we'd like it to be all in this area here, within about 100 KB or so. And as you can see, it's not. So the, the median here is about 500, 600 kilobases. So about 10 times what you might expect to find in a human population. Though that said, no one's actually worked out the 95% confidence interval in human populations. So much better than, than, than we've done in the heterogeneous stock, but still um, uh, not great. But what, what we'd really like to know is, is, well, how many times do we find a single gene? Because in the end, that's what we're interested about. So this is mapping those intervals 
uh, mapping the genes that lie in those intervals, and I'm giving that result here. And you can see the majority we're of loci actually contain only two or three genes. So at least it would, we're, we're got getting down to a, a level where uh, we can ma start making some reasonable guesses about the underlying uh, genes and uh, trying some functional tests there. Uh, this is just a summary of 23 loci where we are mapping over a single gene. Now, I should say we really don't know. This is still guesswork. Just because the locus lies over the gene doesn't mean that it is that gene. Um, but what we've done here is break out the, uh, the information in terms of whether there was a known knockout with a similar phenotype, whether the literature had already implicated that gene. And in about half the cases, that turned out to be so, giving us some confidence that probably in this set where we don't have such information, where it's novel, that indeed some of these genes might be important. So, I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. We've no idea, and um, I, this, this needs somebody who's got a deep interest and knows about literature in determining selection. We, uh, all those tests have not been applied, and they certainly could be. So the frequency, if you go back to the figure I showed you, um, where is it? Here. Yeah, so this, is the, this gives you the uh, heterozygosity levels. You can see it's, it's, the, the sum is really almost nothing there at all. I mean, there are 60,000 of them, but they're, they're all at low frequency, almost all uh, um, um, very, very rare. Yep. So I don't know why, why that should have happened. I mean, it's a strange thing. What's the history of the CFW cross? So what, what the, 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 these are, they're, they're very poorly documented. Um, uh, and that's why the, the companies are able to get away selling what are essentially inbred animals as outbreds, because they don't know it. What we did find about this stock was that the breeders told us that at some stage there had been a reduction in the colony size and had been repopulated from two animals. And that's what got us thinking about whether we could think about haplotype reconstruction, because that meant there should only be four haplotypes segregating. And indeed, when we fit a number of haplotypes to the model, four fits better than, than most stuff. So I think that's probably true. So, so essentially what you have is like a founder. Yes, it's essentially like a founder effect. But, yeah, but then, but everything else. But why should this have, have remained stuck like that? That, it's odd. I, I, there's, there's the other things that often happen in in um, breeding facilities is that, is that animals escape, and sometimes they get in and there's some, you know, illicit mating, and and uh, so you get an injection of extra stuff there, and so that again issues like that may be contributing to this, but we don't know. You sort of see the same thing on chromosome X. So is there yeah. some sort of like, a, is there like they select specific females or something for breeding? Or? Well, it's, we, we'd expect the heterozygosity to be lower anyway. That's pretty consistent. Um, but but I, again, no one's tested whether that's below uh, uh, the expectations of this stock. Um, it, we spent su such a long time working on the genotyping and getting all of this stuff out. There's all these other interesting questions which still need to be dealt with. Okay, thank you very much.